would see ourselves as naturalists. And Ben is working his way from being an amateur naturalist, turning it into, into a profession. And uh, he's going to be talking about his inspirations, what's led him to, to where he's got to now. Um, and I have to say, some very entertaining film clips that we're going to see on the way. So um, do come in and grab a seat. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ben. Ben, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you. Hello, good morning, or just afternoon. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming. It's very kind of you. Um, I'm Ben Wadhams, if you haven't already guessed. Um, and uh, I recently had the very good fortune to be uh, proclaimed the winner of the WWT's um, Search for a Wildlife Presenter competition, um, which was a lovely idea to get people, especially young people, um, involved in the environment and the natural history around them um, and go out and record the wildlife that they found around their home. Um, and as, as a result, I was asked to come and give a, a talk about wildlife presenting and wildlife filmmaking. I actually didn't think I could uh, really do that. Um, I've had um, sort of professional forays, um, so far anyway, into the world of uh, wildlife filmmaking. But um, unless you wanted the talk to last about five minutes, which considering it's coming up to lunchtime, probably wouldn't have been a, a bad idea, so I apologise for that. Um, I couldn't possibly talk just solely on that subject. Uh, what I could do, however, is, if, is give some sort of insight into um, my personal experiences of wildlife and, and wild places um, in a few different locations around the world, um, and as a result of those encounters, um, expand upon the channels by which I managed to sort of eke out a living um, based on a few different things, uh, wildlife filmmaking, um, come in, uh, radio, television, um, art especially, um, and, and writing. Um, but, but always with the natural history being the uh, sort of focus and the, the binding force behind everything I do. And that, in, in a nutshell, is what I'd like to talk to you about. Um, as Jamie said, um, a, a, an amateur naturalist, I suppose, uh, going, going professional, not to be confused with naturist. Uh, I haven't, <laughs> haven't gone professional at that yet. Um, right, so how did, I, how did I first get into wildlife? Um, well, the answer is really... Um, at this organisation, within the walls of this room, in fact. Um, because Sir Peter Scott was one of a, a list of great heroes of mine. Um, and he founded the WT, as I'm sure we all know, in, in 1946. After a lifetime spent, up until then anyway, um, um, hunting and shooting the wildlife and the wild, sorry, the wild fowl that he um, now started preserving. Um, but as any hunter will tell you, um, hunting is, is much more about watching and stalking the wild out of the wildlife, um, rather than actually <laughs> pulling the trigger. And I've never hunted, but um, I've, I've, uh, I do enjoy fishing, and I have done ever so. I have done so since I was about three years old. Um, this was usually the uh, the size of things back then. <laughs> you can see. Um, but I, I remember trying to spend every spare moment I possibly could at, at sort of honing my skills and becoming a better angler. Um, and much to the exasperation of my mother, I'd usually get home from school and, and kick off my shoes and simultaneously jump into my wellies um, without taking any of my school uniform off and be into the canal. Wellies were, of course, of no use whatsoever since the water came up to about there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, that's what I really enjoy doing. I was just out in the wild whenever I possibly could. Um, I remember realising that to be a good angler, to be a good fisherman, you had to be... Um, you'd have to be a good nature detective, which is what every um, half-decent naturalist um, will tell you. You'd have to be a good nature detective, and that was, of course, true for both above and below the water's surface. Um, so I'd usually be off sort of stalking shadows under willows and things like that. Um, and you'd have to be very quiet and, and cautious around the water's edge, which, of course, meant for the fish that you weren't spooking them, but also you'd have to be quiet and cautious um, for, to all wildlife. So anything that was anything would come up, up to you. And uh, it was just, it was a wonderful experience just sitting there on the bank, as I'm sure anyone who fishes will know. So as my uh, quest for the impossible continued, literally, um, I never really caught any monsters, um, I began to realise the beauty and the, and the pleasure one can get from simply sitting and, and being in touch with nature. Um, and that took me far from, from just the water's edge. I had uh, two favourite books I remember as a boy. One of them, as I expect, will ring true for everyone here, or many people here, was uh, Wind in the Willows. And uh, the other was uh, The Elephant's Child. So I sort of had my British children's book, and then I had my more exotic children's book. 
Um, and at the same sort of time, as I was getting more into wildlife, I, I started reading quite advanced sort of texts such as, um, I just jotted down here, The Naked Ape and In the Shadow of Man by uh, Desmond Morris and Dr. Jane Goodall, respectively. And um, I suppose I never quite understood entirely what I was actually reading. Um, but the basis was there to, as a sort of a launch pad uh, towards being passionate about exotic wildlife and animal behavior. And I remember thinking, I, I must get out to these places that I'm reading about in the Elephant's Child and in, uh, in those other texts as well, um, when, I, when I got the chance. Um, so I could go outside and collect the information, uh, be a naturalist in my, in my, uh, around my home and in the woods or around uh, the village I, I lived in. Um, but then I could come back and read these, these papers and these texts about the exotic wildlife as well. So I was, that's where I was getting all my uh, inspiration from. I remember vividly buying my first VHS video cassette and being very excited about it. And that was Life on Earth, David Attenborough's Life on Earth. Um, we actually, as a family, moved over to uh, America shortly after that, so I never actually got to finish it. But I did, I did get to the point, I'm sure um, everyone will remember, the horseshoe crabs coming up and, and laying their um, eggs and, and breeding on the shores. And um, I remember Dave Dutton sort of wading through them all. And uh, actually where they filmed that uh, sequence was just um, up the coast from where we were now living in the States. So uh, we would go, go down to the beach and, and find these things that I was sort of seeing on the television before I'd gone out. And I felt incredibly blessed to have a, a childhood that spanned both the UK and the US. Um, I, I mean, as I said, I was seeing for myself the animals and, and some of the locations that all the wildlife people back in the UK um, were sort of uh, enthusing about and raving about. Um, I remember being asked, for example, to rescue a... Uh, rescue a, um, a snapping turtle from the school playing fields, uh, which is actually, looking back, a fairly dangerous thing to do, but uh, I guess there wasn't much red tape around at that time, uh, or child protection services. Um, anyway, of course, the States, being in the States, uh, firstly it was actually Texas, and then it was up into New England, um, was just full of, of all these wildlife encounters, which I was very lucky to, to see. And the whole, the whole family encountered um, things like wild alligators and um, bison and elk, moose, um, turtles, snakes, salamanders, lizards, um, bears even, bald eagles, whales, you, you name it. And I kind of felt that I was in the middle of it, which was, uh, which was wonderful, really. Really, really wonderful memories. Um, when we came back from the US, uh, I began getting involved with more hands-on conservation. I was, always, I was already in love with natural history that was around me and I just wanted to sort of be able to do my bit, I suppose. Um, as I mentioned, I've been lucky enough to, I, w I was lucky enough to live next to a canal. Um, and that was one of the last strongholds, it still is actually, for uh, the water bowl in the southeast. Um, as indeed it is, of course, here as well. Good, healthy population. Um, and I, I spent the whole summer uh, trapping uh, yeah, trapping, tracking, and microchipping, um, and trying to avoid uh, their teeth. Um, whilst in America, uh, my, my mother uh, helped run an organisation called the Discovery Club, which um, helped infuse and inspire uh, younger children to, to get into the wildlife around them and go out and explore, sort of the, the sort of cubs, I suppose, in a way, scouts. Um, and when she came back, she landed a, a rather good job at Whipsnade Zoo, um, can I ask, is there any, anyone in here from the staff of which Zoo? No, good. I can incriminate myself without fear of repercussion then. <laughs> um, so, so which Zoo, so, yes. Um, because mum was working there, I had a sort of, uh, I guess I leapfrogged the queue a little bit um, as far as work experience went. Um, and I'd always been really fascinated in the cold-blooded species, the, the, um, the crocodiles and the lizards and the snakes, of course, and all that sort of thing, fish. Um, and I remember uh, getting this work experience in the hothouse, which, considering it's December, was I thought quite a good, uh, quite a good move on my part. Um, and uh, I, I, we always kept all of these um, cold-blooded things in the house, much to my dad's annoyance, who doesn't like anything with more or less than two legs. Um, but I used to have uh, geckos and praying mantises and uh, oh, uh, fish and giant lunar moths and sick insects. I'm sure, like a lot of young boys do. Uh, today, and, and then of course the assorted crickets, wax worms, and fruit flies with which to, to feed all of these. Um, so anyway, so there I found myself in the in reptile house, 
thinking I was pretty much at home there. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was a lovely place. It was quite a large building when you consider how small most of the inhabitants were. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was only two people really manning it, one keeper and one uh, incompetent teenager. Um, but not only was the hothouse uh, a showcase for some of the more enigmatic creatures on, on this planet, but it was also a breeding facility for some of the rarest. Um, it was a great place, but I did have a rather horrendous day there once. Um, it began with a, a radio call, I remember, to, uh, to all stations asking, uh, letting everyone know that there was a marmoset, and marmosets are, are small monkeys, as I'm sure you know, and uh, they're allowed to roam free across the park. Um, and overnight, one of them had got into this, uh, to the red pandas exhibit, which are actually fairly vicious animals if, uh, if you're, well, if you're smaller than them. And um, it had been rather badly mauled. So being the closest department to the red pandas, we all jogged off there and, uh, to see what we could do. And I remember, this is bearing in mind, this is one of my first days, thought I'd try and uh, impress the boss by uh, and jumping in and grabbing this little, this little marmosette because it needed something to be wrapped up in because it was so cold. So I did that, and that was fine, and it made it to the vet, and the vet took it off us, and we went back to the hothouse. And I remember getting back in the hothouse, having my shirt back on, the old blood staying here and there, and, uh, and just feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And I started sort of itching all over, <laughs> and I couldn't stop. And, um, and then I looked down, and there was just fleas everywhere, oh, um, <laughs> which, uh, which involved them being uh, sort of fumigated, which isn't a pleasant experience, I can assure you. Um, so I didn't start off with a great up until about 10 a.m. I wasn't feeling great. Um, but then the second job for the day was to clean out the uh, parchulas. Um, parchulas are snails, very small snails, um, very rare. And at Whipsnade, I believe they're still doing it, but certainly a few years ago they were, um, they were involved really at the cutting edge of this breeding program to breed them back up and to get healthy populations back in the wild. Um, and my, my job was to go in and uh, clean out the tank um, and there was a, I remember there was a glass pane on the bottom um, which was smeared with this sort of uh, mix of fruit and fibre and a paste. And I had to get that out, which obviously had several hundred snails on considering the size of them. Get that out and clean it off. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll prop that up on the side and then I'll clean up the tank and then I'll put the food back in. So I did that, but I managed to nudge the table a little bit. And I remember looking through the tank and seeing this pain sort of reaching the point of no return and then going down a sort of downward trend, terminal trend if you were a snail. Um, so unfortunately, uh, due to my ineptitude, um, I, think, I don't think it was an exaggeration to say that uh, quite a sizable proportion of the population, uh, global population was probably wiped out in, uh, in that single act of ineptitude, as I say. Anyway, it dawned on me that my first... Um, my first professional job, I suppose, as a, as a conservationist, had not been a success. Um, so I suppose I wasn't to be a, a, a zookeeper, but, but what was I to be? I, I went to university to study the only two sort of things that I was ever any half good at, um, and that was geography uh, and art. I managed to wangle my way into agreeing to my tutors, to, uh, from my geography tutors, that I could study um, biogeography and conservation, and to my art tutors that I could study wildlife art. So again, the theme was still there with, uh, with natural history. Um, my grandfather used to work in Johannesburg in South Africa, so we used to go out and visit him. Um, again, very lucky, we used to go out and visit him, um, which was terribly exciting, especially as the, the Kruger Park was uh, literally on, the door, on his doorstep. Um, so uh, I remember on one, uh, I think it was probably the third visit, we decided that uh, we'd like to go, the family would like to go a bit further afield. Um, so on one occasion, we all made our way north um, and on, into Botswana and Namibia. Um, and, and there I could um, study for my finals, as it were, because I could ask the conservationists the question I needed to ask them about biogeography, and I could sketch the animals for my uh, wildlife art finals. Um, so, so that was lovely. Um, I'd like to talk about Africa um, a little bit more in just a moment. Um, but I, I was certainly bitten by the bug in those first few visits. Um, one, uh, one of my other great heroes, adding to that list, is, uh, was uh, David Livingstone. And um, on his last fatal, uh, turned out to be fatal expedition um, to, to Africa, to the continent, he said in his journal, um, the mere thought of, I'm not going to do the accent by the way, because he's Scottish, 